Colossians chapter 4, if you have your Bibles. Lest you thought we would just overlook these last three verses. We do not want to do that. God has something for us in these closing verses. We've been studying this letter of Colossians for close to eight months. Uh, Started off this study... Uh, actually, Charlie had been talking to me. He said he'd been studying Colossians. We had a look at it, and I thought, you know what? We, me, Lisa, and Leland, we went off to uh, Turkey, and we were going to Colossae. I thought that would be a good idea. And so we, we went there, and uh, we, we got there, and we went to Colossae. I believe it was one of the first uh, days when we got to that section of Turkey. And I'm expecting to see all these ruins and all these great things. You know what we saw? Nothing but a hill. We got pictures of it. I want to show it to you. It's very impressive. There it is. That's Colossae right there. That's about all you see. Go ahead and show the next one. There it is right there. That's Colossae. We showed up, and uh, I'm thinking we're going to see all these great things, maybe even locate where the church is, and it's just a hill. Uh, Show the next one. At least there's a couch on top of the hill. You can look out over uh, that couch. Uh, but, but that's all that there is. And, and what's, what's, I guess, kind of frustrating is that our guide said that while we were there during that week, the government just approved to give archaeologists the go-ahead on starting to dig in Colossae after we left. Uh, so I want to show you Laodicea, which is five miles away. Go ahead and show the next picture. Um, I believe it's... it's uh, Right there, well, you can show the next. This is, we're we're there in Laodicea. Notice all the ruins. This used to be under a hill too. It was was a big hill. That's all there was. There was a a big tree. They showed us a picture of a big tree, and next to it was one pillar, and that's all there was of Laodicea. The government gave them the go-ahead. Start digging. See if you can find some stuff. They find all. Show the next picture. There's stuff everywhere in Laodicea. You can show the next one. There, there's the, the Colosseum. Seats about 10,000 people. Uh, show the next one. Now, you can't see it because it's blurry, but right up in the middle to the left, you see a little white, a little white. It looks like a cloud almost. It's not a cloud. What you're seeing is the city of Hierapolis. The city of Hierapolis is it's almost completely white. The, ma- the mountains are white. Uh, and so that's what you're seeing. You see how far Hierapolis is from... Uh, oh, thank you. Look at that right there. I appreciate that. Um, that's how far Hierapolis is away. So, so anyway, we are going to look tonight at the final words of the Apostle Paul to this small church located on top of that hill, uh, underneath that hill, called Colossae. And in these concluding verses, you're going to see there's an, an unusual twist. And let's, let's read it. It's Colossians chapter 4. Stand with us and we'll read the final three verses of this chapter from the Apostle Paul to this church of Colossae. It says in verse 16, And when this epistle is read among you, cause that it be read also in the church of the Laodiceans. We just saw that town not too far away. And that ye likewise read the epistle from Laodicea. And say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfill it. The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Remember my bonds. Grace be with you. Amen. God, we love you, Lord. We thank you for your word. We thank you for this book, Lord. Lord, how it's taught us about uh, the, the sufficiency of of Jesus Christ and, and the deficiency of false cults. And Lord, the, 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 the overwhelming uh, sufficiency of, of the Christian life and how you provide for us. So God, I pray that you be with us these few moments tonight as we close out this wonderful book, the book of Colossians. Help us to, to say what you've laid on our hearts. Speak to hearts as only you can. For it's in Jesus' name, amen. As we read in verse number 16, if you notice, there were three different times that the Apostle Paul makes reference to reading of some letters. And he says, I want this letter of Colossians to read not only to be read not only among you, but I also want it read also in the church of Laodicea. 
Now, as we saw, the church at Laodicea is a church located in a city very uh, close, very near to Colossae, about five miles away. We don't know a whole lot about this church, but it's interesting that Paul, after the Colossian church reads this letter, he wants it sent to them so that they can read it too. And then he says this, and in turn, I want you, the church of Colossae, to read the letter from Laodicea. Now now get this, we don't know where that letter is. We don't know what that letter says. We don't no longer have the letter of Laodicea anymore. It's, It's not been preserved for us. For some reason, the Holy Spirit did not choose to put the letter of the Laodiceans in the Bible. So just think, we could have had a book in the Bible called Laodicea. I could have said, turn to 1st Laodicea chapter 2. 2nd Laodicea chapter 4. We we don't have that though. So there's a mystery here of this unknown letter, but there's also a message to us and that Paul specifically says, I want you to take your letter and send it over to those Laodiceans. And I want them to read it too. So I want to say three things very quickly. First of all, we see that there was a special message that Paul wanted spoken to the Laodiceans. There was a special message. What is that special, special message that Paul had for the Laodiceans? Well, as you know, this is not the only time the Laodicean church is mentioned in our Bible. When you come to the book of Revelation, go ahead and turn there. Revelation chapter 3. We're going to be turning a lot in our Bibles tonight, so be ready. When you come to the book of Revelation, we have some letters written to seven different churches. And you may recall that one of those letters was to the church of Laodicea. Now get this, 35 years after Paul wrote this letter to the church in Colossae, the Lord Jesus addresses a letter to the Laodicean church. It's a very interesting comparison. Because when you study this church of Laodicea and you study about the history of it, there is evidence that the Laodicean church at this particular time that Colossians was written, it was a church that was alive, it was a church that was alert, and it was a church that was active. But 35 years later, when the Lord comes to write the church at Laodicea, guess what? There's no more excitement in the church. There's no enthusiasm. There's no evangelism taking place in the church. Notice what Jesus writes to this church in Revelation 3 verse 14. And unto the angel the church of the Laodiceans write, These things saith the Amen. Now that word, the Amen, means Jesus. These things saith Jesus. Notice, the faithful and true witness. That's Jesus. The beginning of the creation of God. That's Jesus. Notice what he says. I know thy works. That thou art neither cold or hot. I would that thou art cold or hot. So then because thou art lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will spew thee out of my mouth. Because thou sayest, I am rich and increased with goods and have need of nothing. Does that not sound like a merit today? Amen, Notice what he says. Knowest not that thou art wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Here is a picture of a church that has lost its fire. They are now lukewarm. It has gotten so bad that Jesus says, You are a church that when I look at you, you make me sick to my stomach. The question we have is, how did this church in 35 years get into this situation? What were the circumstances that caused that church to become lukewarm? Well, I think the key is back in the book of Colossians. Where Paul says in the 16th verse, I want you to have this letter. Take it to the Laodiceans and make them read it. Why? Because I think you have in the book of Colossians, if we've already studied... There are some truths that churches of all the ages, this one included, if we will apply them, we will keep ourselves from becoming lukewarm and indifferent. See, I personally believe we're living in a Laodicean age of the church. I believe we're already there. 
I don't know when Jesus is coming back. We don't go around setting dates. But it's very clear to me as I read the scriptures and I look at the circumstances and conditions of the world around us and the condition of the church itself that for the most part, the church is in the Laodicean age. So what is there in this book of Colossians that can keep a church from becoming like the Laodicean church? What is it in this letter of Colossians that can keep you and me from becoming indifferent and cold and unconcerned and apathetic in our personal Christian lives? There's two things I see that stand out right away. First thing is this. We must totally believe, and we've already looked at this, but I'm rehashing it. We must totally believe in the supremacy of Jesus Christ. I want to quickly review and look at some things that we've looked at already, but I think they're fundamental to this issue of why Paul said, make sure the Laodiceans get a hold of this book because they need to read this. Look back in Colossians chapter 1 because I see there's some truths here that should keep us on fire for the Lord. And that will keep our hearts stirred for the Lord Jesus Christ. Look in chapter 1, beginning in verse number 18. The Bible says this, And He, Jesus Christ, is the head of the body, the church. We thank God for the music God has blessed us with here. We thank God for the preaching of the Word. We thank God for the blessings He poured out on our church and our school. We thank God for the fellowship that we have with one another. But what is far more important than any of those aspects of the church is the presence and the power of the Holy Spirit in our church. The presence and the power of the Lord Jesus Christ dwelling in our church. Jesus said with His own words, you've heard it, where two or three are gathered. What did He say He'd do? He said, I'll show up and I'll be in the midst. Which means that the Lord Jesus Christ is right here in our service tonight. How can we not be excited about that? How can we be cold and indifferent and and apathetic? That is exciting to me that Jesus promises to show up if two or three are here. You can't be Laodicean when you believe the Lord Jesus is in our presence and is involved in the activities of our church. Paul said he's the head of the body, the church. That's not all. Look at down at the end of verse 27. He says, Christ in you, the hope of glory. See, Jesus is not only the Lord of this church... Jesus Christ should be the Lord of our Christian lives. Why is that? He already said, because Christ lives in you. When you invited Jesus to be your personal Savior, the Bible says, in the person of the Holy Spirit, He comes to dwell in your heart. Look back at verse 18, the last sentence there. He says that in all things, He, Jesus Christ, might have the preeminence. So when Jesus is preeminent in your life, when it dawns on you that Jesus Christ lives in you and you surrender total control of your life to Jesus, I'm telling you, you won't be a Laodicean Christian. If Jesus is number one, if every day of your life Jesus Christ is absolutely first in your life, you won't be a Laodicean Christian. You won't get cold. You won't be half-hearted. You'll be excited. You'll be enthused about the Lord and His church. But Paul said, be sure this letter is read to the Laodiceans. And I wonder, did Paul already see something starting to slip in this church in Laodicea? I'm telling you, if they had heeded this letter, then they wouldn't have needed the letter Jesus sent to them 35 years later. So what will keep us from being a Laodicean church? Number one is the supremacy of Christ. Here's the second thing, though. Not only the supremacy of Christ, but the sufficiency of Christ. That Christ is enough. Do you need more? Do we need extra? 
You know, there, there are churches today that do all these kind of things. Listen, Jesus is enough. He's sufficient. And I believe, I believe we've won the, the infallibility issue for the most part. That, that Jesus in the Word, it's, it's the infallible Word of God. But have we won the sufficiency issue? Because I'm telling you, I meet more Christians who are unhappy today and don't have the joy of the Lord in their life. Is He not sufficient? I'm telling you, the sufficiency that Jesus is all I want, that Jesus is all I need, that should keep you on fire for the Lord. Go to the second chapter, third verse. Here's why. Notice what he says. Talking about Jesus, Paul says in verse number 3, In whom are hid all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge. That statement says specifically that all the treasures you will ever want are found only in Jesus Christ. All the wealth is in Jesus. All the riches in Jesus. I thought if they announced tonight that they had discovered gold in Sefner, there would be a mad rush to Sefner to find some gold. Of course, the only gold you're going to find in Sefner is in old people's mouths and teeth. People will be trying to find the gold. People are searching everywhere to find treasures of life and riches here and there. They're trying to find meaning. They're trying to find purpose. But if you're a Christian, you already have all those things. You've already found the treasure. You know where the gold is. It's in Jesus Christ. And if that's the truth, why wouldn't we be excited about that? Why wouldn't that keep us on fire for the Lord? Not only all the treasures, but in the second chapter, verse 15... It says, and having spoiled principalities and powers, he, Jesus Christ, made a show of them openly, triumphing over them in it. You know what that's describing? It's describing the cross of Christ. So not only are there riches and treasures in Jesus, but Paul's telling us all the victory is in Jesus also. Jesus won the victory on the cross. Jesus won the battle on the cross. And I understand there are, there are people and we, we have battle temptation. All of us do. You may struggle with self-esteem. You have all kinds of things that you're going to encounter. But the good news for the Christian is that because of what Jesus did on the cross of Calvary, victory has been provided for us. You and I can have victory in our circumstances. We can have victory over our situation. Because when the dust settled on the cross, remember what Jesus said? It is finished. Jesus won the victory. You and I don't fight for victory as Christians. We fight because of victory. I read a true story. It was in Reader's Digest about an old Confederate soldier who came out of the Ozark Mountains. The Civil War had been over for about 20 years. But he didn't know it was over. He had ran off. He had hidden for 20 years. And after 20 years, he came out of the mountains. And he said, I don't care what General Lee says. I'm giving up and I'm not fighting anymore. He said, if they want to hang me for treason, I don't care. I'm giving up. I'm not fighting anymore. The problem was the battle was already over and he didn't know it. And see, there are a lot of people today struggling in their own strength. They're battling in their own power, in their own ability. Let Jesus says, I have paid the victory for you. I paid the price on the cross of Calvary. That shouldn't make us cold and apathetic. You can't be Laodicean when you remember that Jesus Christ won the battle of victory for you and me on the cross. But I'm telling you, when... When you get away from these main issues, that's when the danger of Laodicea kicks in. When you don't get excited about the cross of Christ, and I know, listen, we hear it a lot, but it, when it becomes mundane to you, when that doesn't excite you, we start to slide into this Laodicean age. Do we fully believe in the supremacy of Christ? That He is the head of the church. 
that he has the preeminence in our lives? Do we believe in the sufficiency of Christ, that all the treasures are found in him, that there is victory and power over the death and resurrection? If we don't, we're nearing the outskirts of Laodicea. So Paul says, take this letter and have it read to the Laodiceans. That's the special message. Then we move to the second point. He moves from a, a special message to a special ministry. And it's back in Colossians chapter 4. In verse number 17, there's a personal word addressed to a man by the name of Archippus. Now we don't know exactly who he is. He's mentioned one other time. It's in Philemon verse 2. Most believe that Archippus was the son of Philemon. And that he was now pastoring the church that was in his father Philemon's house. But there's a personal word addressed by Paul to this man Archippus. And it's very simple. In verse 17 he says, Archippus, take heed to the ministry you have received in the Lord that thou fulfill it. Church, I want you to know that's the message God has for every one of us. He is saying, Archippus, God has given you a ministry. Be sure that you do it. Be sure that you carry it out. And he may have been the preacher, and he, he may have been the minister of the gospel called to preach. We just don't know for sure. But evidently, there was an assignment he had been given God had given him a ministry, and he says, Archippus, take heed to the ministry you've received in the Lord. You know, sometimes we get the idea that just preachers are the only ones who are in the ministry. Yet the Bible teaches that every Christian here has a ministry. Someone asked, who are the ministers at the First Real Baptist Church? How many ministers do you have? I tell them, four or five hundred people. That's how many ministers we have. Because every single one of you should have a ministry. That word ministry simply uh, is where we get the word deacon. It means to serve others. I want you to understand tonight that Christianity is not a spectator sport. A lot of people think that it is. Let's go to church. Let's watch the show. Let's see how they do today. See if the music is right today. See if the preacher did good today. It's not a spectator sport. Football's a spectator sport. Someone said about football, there you see 22 guys in need of rest being watched by 50,000 people in need of exercise. <laughs> but not Christianity. That's not a spectator sport. Every one of us are to be on the playing field. Every single one. Turn back to Ephesians chapter 4. i got some more verses to read to you. Ephesians chapter 4. Look at verse number 11. Paul says, And he gave some apostles, some prophets, some evangelists, some pastors, and teachers. Verse 12. For the perfecting, that word perfecting means to equip. For the equipping of the who? Of the saints for the what? For the work of the what? Of the ministry. And what does all of that do? It edifies the body of Christ. Who does the work of the ministry? Paul says, the saints. It's our job as preachers to equip the saints... To do the work of ministry. Amen. Meaning this. You have a ministry. Yes. You have a place of service. How do I find it, preacher? Find something that needs to be done and start doing it. Amen. I don't like how they do this at that church. Why don't you do that like that other church? What are you doing about it? 
find something that needs to be done here and start doing it. And do it for the Lord. You pray, God will give you a ministry. And I'm telling you what, He'd give it to you and He'll help you carry it out. I love the story of Moses in the Old Testament. The Lord called Moses and He said, Moses, I'm sending you to Pharaoh. And Moses said, Lord, who am I? And then he said this, Lord, who do I, who do I tell them is, is sending me? In the next sentence, the Lord said, you tell them, I am sent you. You know what he's saying? Moses, it's not who you are. It's who I am. You don't go in your own power. You go in my power. I'll equip you. So you're here tonight, you don't think you can serve Jesus? Yes, you can. The same Christ who saved you can give you the ability and power to serve Him. I love the verse, 1 Timothy 1.12. It's a very encouraging verse. It says this. Paul said, I thank Christ Jesus our Lord, who hath enabled me, for that He counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. The Lord is the one who puts you into your place of service. And the great news is, it's the same Lord Jesus who puts you in the ministry. He will enable you to carry out that ministry. Paul says, and say to Archippus, Take heed to the ministry which thou hast received in the Lord, that thou fulfilled. So he's given a special message, and he's given a special ministry. And last of all, we see Paul's special marking. This is where we close out the book of Colossians. It's with Paul's special marking. It's found in verse 18. There's a special mark that Paul always puts on his letters. He says in verse 18, The salutation by the hand of me, Paul. Now here's what's interesting about this verse. Paul had a secretary. Some of you have a secretary. You tell them what you want written and they write it. When they get done writing it, they bring it in. You read over it. You like it. What do you do? You sign your name to it. That's what Paul usually did. We know the name of his secretary. It's found in Romans 16, verse 22. His name is Tertius. And Tertius would copy down on parchment... What the old apostle wanted to say, and then when Paul was finished copying it all down, or when Tertius was finished copying all down what Paul wanted said, Paul would then take his pen himself and, and he would give a special marking of his own handwriting to authenticate and prove that this is what he wanted and that it was genuine. Paul says in 2 Thessalonians 3.17, he says, The salutation of Paul with my own hand, which is the token in every epistle, saying I do this in every one of them. And he says, so I write. That was the distinguishing mark in his letters. So here's Paul in prison. He has dictated this letter to his secretary, Tertius, and now it's, it's finished. He's done. And Paul walks over. Maybe he crawled over. And he takes that quill. And he writes out this final word with his own hand that authenticates his letter. And I couldn't help but think, Ronald, that as he does, you might have heard that chain bouncing across the pages. Now I want you to look at the special words he writes as he closes in verse 18. He says this. Remember my bonds. Remember my bonds. Now I want you to understand, he's not calling attention to himself to be pitied. But it's evident to us. Here is a man who is suffering for the Lord Jesus Christ in a cold, dark cell in Rome. He has paid a price for his faith. By the way, it won't be long now until he writes another letter to a young pastor named Timothy and then Paul will lose his head on a chopping block. 
Up to now, he's been beaten, publicly embarrassed, whipped within an inch of his life, dragged outside cities to die. He's lost all worldly possessions. He's lost friends. But he never lost sight of what God called him to do. What has it cost you and me lately to be a Christian? What price have we paid to follow Christ? Paul says, remember my bonds. And then he closes his letter as he did many others. I love how he closes it. Grace be with you. Amen. That's his special mark. Grace. That's how the letter opens in verse 2. He says, grace be unto you. And that's how his letter concludes. Grace be with him. That's his special mark. And I thought as I read that, we all need to understand that whatever you and I are, it's all because of the grace of God. Whatever you've been given through Jesus Christ, it's all because of His grace. I've learned three great lessons since becoming a Christian. Saved at five, I've learned these three things. I hope you've learned them too. Number one, I can't do anything to save myself. Number two, God doesn't expect me to do anything to save myself. And number three, Jesus Christ has done everything that needed to be done to save myself. And it's all because of grace. I know for a fact, tonight, there are three to four people who are watching our live stream who've never accepted Jesus as their Savior. Do you want to be saved? For by grace are you saved through faith. Grace is God reaching down. Faith is you reaching up to take what God has already given. You want grace? You come to God and you'll find it. He's the God of all grace. But you must, by faith, just as you are, receive that grace. It's there for the taking. All you have to do is receive it. I love the story about the painter. He was getting ready to paint a picture of the prodigal son. So he went out. He found a homeless guy. He's ragged. He looked dirty. He asked him, would you come to my studio? I, I want to paint the picture. The homeless man agreed. A couple hours, that homeless guy got to the studio. But guess what? He had taken a bath. He had spruced up a little bit. The painter said, what in the world have you done? He said, well, I thought if I was going to be in a picture, I'd fix myself up a little bit. The painter said, oh, no. I wanted you to come just as you are. That's how it is with Jesus. Amen. You don't have to fix yourself up one bit to come to Jesus Christ. You come just as you are. You can't get better first. You come just as you are. Jesus makes you better. The old song, Just As I Am. Amen. Without one plea, but that thy blood was shed for me. And what does it say? O Lamb of God, I'm coming. Wouldn't you like to come to the Lord just like that? You who are watching, wouldn't you love to come to the Lord yeah. just like that? You don't have to earn it. You just have to receive it. It's all you have to do. Come to Jesus and receive His grace through faith in Him. Heads bowed and eyes closed. We get